Thank you, everybody. It's uh, great to be able to join you again here and uh, trust that uh, the Lord will, will bless us as we study together tonight and as we wrestle with some issues again. Um, I'm not going to go back and recap all that we did last time. If you missed that series, if perhaps you could get, uh, get the audio recordings to, to go back there. And just all that I want to say is, um, you know, this is the book that I wrote was really just uh, the result of my own personal struggles, my own journey. I don't claim that I have all the answers or that I know everything. I still have a lot of loose ends. And um, my goal is not to try and convince somebody away from any other view or to somehow point a finger at people or say that they're wrong or bad or anything else. Um, I'm just an ordinary Christian who has the word of God, the Bible. And as I worked through that and as, as the Lord convicted me, my, my views on election and predestination have changed dramatically through my Christian life. And, uh, you know, I, my, my goal became uh, to simply return to the plain truth of Scripture and to allow the Word of God to speak for itself and to give the words of Scripture the definitions that God has given in His Word. Um, I think we all struggle with, with the reality that we come to the Scriptures with preconceived ideas and presuppositions, and sometimes we... We come uh, with other people's opinions in our minds as well. And it's all too easy to um, run to a Bible dictionary or to run to a commentary to see what something says instead of wrestling it through. And I was guilty of that on this topic for, for many, many years. But uh, you know, I, I trust that these, these little studies together, and if you've had the opportunity to be reading through the book, that the Lord will somehow use it uh, to to focus our minds to, to bring us to a more uh, clear understanding of election and predestination, not as contentious issues, not as things to be argued over, but as blessed truths uh, that, that the Lord has given us, you know, good answers and firm answers in his word. So having said all that, uh, if you're following along in the book, uh, we've, we're coming to section four in the book, which deals with the election of, of the church. And there's a number of key scriptures that are listed in the book, and we're going to take a look at some of those tonight. We may not get through, through everything. I'm going to spend a bit of time on these tonight because what I hope to establish tonight is specifically the idea of election as it relates to the church. And obviously that relates to everything in in the New Testament. Uh, when we ended last time, we'd been looking at the election of the disciples and the apostles specifically. And uh, we'd looked extensively at the Gospel of John and particularly statements in, in John 6, 10, 15, and 17. So again, if you missed that, perhaps go back to that because what we found was again and again in the Old and the New Testament, election is not unto salvation but election is unto purpose and privilege. Purpose and privilege, again and again, we've seen that. And we'll see that again tonight as we, as we look at this topic of election of the church. So we're going to begin in Ephesians chapter one, uh, just because these are very, very foundational. Um, it is interesting that uh, the word elect or chosen only occurs once in the whole book of Ephesians. Uh, and it's here in uh, Ephesians chapter 1. <clears throat> we also have a couple of instances of the word predestined or predestined uh, in, in the New Testament. And there's only four references to predestined in the whole New Testament. There's none, ref none of the references to predestinated or predestined in the Old Testament. So Ephesians chapter 1 is a significant chapter in relationship to, to election and predestination. For tonight, I'm just going to deal with the question of election and not get into predestination too much. Hope to look at that in, in a couple of weeks' time. But uh, you have Ephesians 1, 1 through 6 there, there on the screen. And uh, the focus of attention is uh, verses, verse 4 particularly. But uh, beginning to read in verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, 
just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. So that'll be kind of the main um, focus of our, of our study right now. Now, I was always taught that Ephesians 1 verse 4 is one of those passages that silences and settles all disputes about election. Um, I remember turning to this passage many times when people asked me questions about election. And I said, well, there it absolutely says we were chosen uh, in him before the foundation of the world. So obviously God picked us for salvation and uh, it happened way back in eternity. So end of end of argument. I believe that I taught that for many years, but the Lord has brought me to quite a different uh, perspective now. So I want us to look at this, um, this context that this statement occurs in, chosen in Christ. And the first thing is the context of the audience, the context of the audience. If you go back to verse one, <clears throat> the apostle Paul is writing to the saints who are in Ephesus and faithful in Christ Jesus. That's who the epistle is addressed to. Um, and so it's key that we understand that, 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 that we see that point. Um, the two phrases here are, are parallel. Uh, the saints are those who are faithful in Christ Jesus. And the word faithful here in, in the Greek is pistuos, an adjective in the dative case. <clears throat> and it simply means those who believe in something or who, or who believe toward something. So the saints are those who believe in or toward, and in this sp specific context, that they have believed in Jesus Christ. So who is the epistle written to? It's written to those who believe, those who have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. So I think you need to just understand that the word faithful here is not used in a way that we sometimes think of it. Um, you know, there's, there's just a few who are faithful in the sense of them being special or unique or, or in a, you know, an elite class. The word here, it doesn't mean that at all. It simply means those who have faith, uh, who are full of faith, those who have trusted, who have believed in, in the Lord Jesus Christ. So that's the context chosen in Christ. That phrase is written to the saints, to those who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse two, Paul, in his address, in his opening address, says grace to you. Again, who is he speaking of? those who are saints, who have faith in the Lord Jesus. Verse three says, he has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. Who is the us? That's the saints, those who are in Christ Jesus. And then verse four says, just as, or according to, or in like manner, he chose us. So as uh, we have believed in the Lord Jesus, as we receive grace from him, uh, as he has blessed us, so in like manner, he chose us. And it's an, important to see that connection from verse 3. As he has blessed us, that is the believers, with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. So he has chosen us, believers, those who have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. So it's not saying that he has chosen those who are not believers to become believers, but he chose us who are already believers. So again, just to highlight that point, so Ephesians 1 and verse 4 does not say God chose or elected lost or unsaved people to become in Christ. It doesn't say he chose us to be in Christ. It says he chose us in Christ. God chose or elected those who have faith in Christ. So as we've seen clearly throughout our study, election is not to salvation from sin. Whenever you see the word elect, election, elected, remember that we've established it throughout the entire scripture. Election is not to salvation, but election is always to purpose and privilege, purpose and privilege. And I think that's, that's fundamental. That, that's something that we have to hold to very tenaciously. 
and something that as we read through scripture, let that definition of election uh, stay uppermost in, in your mind. Another important note is that Ephesians 1 and verse 4 does not say God chose or elected me or you singular. It says he chose us, plural. Who is it that he has chosen? The saints, those who have believed in Jesus. Now in the context of the book of Ephesians, the believers, the saints, are those who make up the church. Uh, Ephesians is the epistle more than any other that explains what the church is. And, and Paul says God specifically has given to him this revelation, this knowledge of the mystery of Christ in terms of explaining the church. Now, when I first saw that this was plural and not singular, that really shook me because I'd always taught and thought that it was and on an individual basis. God chose me individually before the foundation of the world to become a Christian. But that is not, absolutely not what this verse is saying. This is not a reference to individual election, but a, a, a reference to God's purposes for a group. And that group is the church. Now, Paul says that this church is a mystery which from the beginning of ages has been hidden in God. And I put up on the screen there these verses, uh, verses 3 through 6 in Ephesians 3, because we're, we're introduced clearly to the idea that the main topic of conversation in, in Ephesians is the church. This is a mystery. Paul says his knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known. Um, the word mystery doesn't mean something which is kind of, you know, mysterious, but simply something which had not been previously revealed. But now it is revealed. It's been revealed by the Spirit to his holy apostles and prophets. And the, the essence of this mystery is that this entity, this group of believers, the church, comprises Jews and Gentiles. Jews and Gentiles alike can partake of the promise of God in Christ Jesus by the gospel, the promise of forgiveness of sins, the promise of salvation. And just as an, a side note, again, this struck me one day when I realized that my view, which I'd held for 25 years, which taught that the church is an extension of Israel, the church was revealed in the Old Testament, that was the church, and now the New Testament church, just an extension of it. That can't be true because Paul says the church was a mystery before, had not yet been revealed. It's only revealed now through the, the apostles. Uh, the church did not exist in the Old Testament. It's a new entity in terms of being revealed. It's not a new entity to God because the mystery of the church has been planned from before the foundation of the world. But it had only been revealed in time through the apostles. So Ephesians 1 and verse 4 says that we, the saints, those who believe the church, was elect in Christ before the foundation of the world. Now, this is a marvelous thought. God designed and planned the church even before the world was created. Uh, mystery, we can't answer all the questions. We're not God. We don't have all knowledge. The Lord has not chosen to reveal us, to reveal to us every aspect of, of his thought and mind. Uh, probably because even if he did, we couldn't grasp it, we, we couldn't see it. But, but in the heart of God, this was a truth. This was an entity that was planned by God uh, from all ages. Um, verse 11 there of Ephesians chapter 3 speaks of the eternal purpose of God for the church, uh, which he accomplished in Christ Jesus. I think it's, you know, when you look at that, according to the eternal purpose, which he accomplished in Christ Jesus, our Lord. And then you back up verse 10, the manifold wisdom of God might be known by the church. God is revealing his, his goodness, his glory, his grace, his wisdom through the church. And I think it's just a, a marvelous, marvelous truth. So 
when you look at this, the church is elect in Christ, and that's fundamental. God's purposes for the church are accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. The church could not exist before Christ was incarnate, died, and was resurrected. Uh, and we believe the church came into existence in, uh, in Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost. Uh, very few references in the Gospels, the church, uh, Matthew chapter 16, when Jesus speaks of church, it's future, it hasn't come into being yet. Uh, after Acts chapter 2, we see the word church used uh, frequently in, in, in the, the, that letter. God's purpose is accomplished in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, here's a truth that we found clearly in the Old Testament. The nation of Israel was elect in Abraham by physical birth, by natural birth. God chose Abraham. Abraham was beloved. All of those who were born of Abraham were automatically part of the elect. Clearly, it was not an election unto salvation. Israel had purposes to fulfill. But many of the elect people of God in the Old Testament rejected the Lord. And then we saw non-elect people who believed in God and joined themselves to the elect people of God and enjoyed the benefits of being the physical people of God. But just as the nation of Israel was elect in Abraham, so the church is elect in Christ. And but the church enters that relationship to Christ through spiritual birth. In other words, of becoming born again. And when any person trusts the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, applied to them all the blessings and the benefits, uh, the sufficiency of who Christ is and what he has accomplished. So this phrase in Christ, just we cannot emphasize that enough. I think that is, that is so significant. Abraham was beloved of God, but the Lord Jesus is eminently, preeminently the beloved of God. Uh, the Lord loved Abraham's descendants for Abraham's sake. The Lord loves the spiritual offspring of Christ for Christ's sake. Uh, we are accepted in the beloved one. This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Hear ye him. What a marvelous truth that, that that is and something we can truly rejoice in. Now, a question that we must ask, to what is the church elected? To what is the church elected? Um, Ephesians is speaking about this, this church, us, um, uh, in Christ, in him. Um, and, and the references, I believe there's about 130 times in the book of Ephesians that some form of in Christ or in him or in the beloved is used. So what is this church elected for? Well, uh, verse four tells us, he chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Now, I gotta tell you as one who always assumed that election was unto salvation, I was absolutely stunned one day to realize that in this context, the Lord has plainly stated the purpose of his election of believers, that we should be holy and blameless before him. Uh, it's funny, but I, I mentioned this in the book, but I distinctly remember the first time I saw this. I actually blurted it out loud, even though I was by myself. I said, but, but, but the text doesn't say they were chosen for salvation. I was always taught that it was. I always believed that it was. And so it was an astounding thing that was right there before my eyes, but I couldn't see it because of my theological blinkers. Um, I saw what I wanted to, to see. The purpose for which the church is chosen is that it should be holy. There's lots of scriptures we can go to to, to corrob corroborate this, but uh, Ephesians chapter 5 is a lovely cross-reference. It talks about husbands loving your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. And, and look at the purpose that the Lord Jesus would, would save and cleanse with the washing of water that he might present the church to himself, a glorious church, having no spot or wrinkle, that she should be holy and without blame or without blemish before him. There's the purpose of the election of the church. In Ephesians 2, 21 and 22, Paul says the church grows into a holy temple in the Lord. Um, in Colossians chapter 1 and verse 22, 
He says the Lord's purpose is to present you holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight. Uh, Colossians 3.12, he calls the elect of God holy and beloved. Um, in 1 Peter 2, he, Peter describes the church as a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people. Uh, it's not surprising when you think the Lord Jesus in his character is described as holy, harmless, undefiled and separate from sinners. He knew no sin. And his body, the church, the vessel through whom he has chosen to display himself in this world and carry the gospel, that vessel ought to reflect his character as he is holy, so we are to be holy. That's a tremendous challenge because if we're honest, we're not holy by character nature, not by inclination. Our most natural tendencies are, are the opposite of, of holiness. Peter says, be holy for I am holy, says the Lord. So every believer saved and joined to Christ by faith is, is called to this, this high calling uh, to be holy in Christ. And so in this sense, when we think of our election as part of the church, um, it's a tremendous challenge to us. So I'm going to just move ahead for time's sake to look at Colossians chapter 3 now as the second verse in our discussion of the election of the church. And in Colossians 3, 12, we read, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another and forgiving one another. If anyone is a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. So just a few things to, to note. Um, the word the, the definite article, is not there in the Greek. So it doesn't actually say the elect. It simply says as elect of God. The other thing to notice is that the word elect there, uh, eklektoi, is in the plural. It's not you singular, but you plural. The church, you as a group of, of believers, you plural, um, are chosen of God. And again, we see that phrase that we've already mentioned, holy and beloved, holy and beloved. Um, exactly the purpose of the church as we've already been noting here. But I think something else, again, that's significant is when you look through Colossians 3, there are many commands given to the elect. It says, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, and so on, bearing with one another, forgiving one another, um, put on love, let the peace of God rule in your heart, be thankful, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, etc. Do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to, the, to God the Father through him. So as you move your way through uh, Colossians 3, the, the, there's this strong emphasis on, on this reality. The elect have to make personal choices and face personal responsibilities as children of God. So what that shows to us is that God's election does not automatically become fulfilled in the life of, of individuals. Uh, the elect still have to make personal decisions. We saw that in the Old Testament. Israel was elect for purposes to display the glory of God, to be a light to the nations. Many of them chose not to fulfill the purposes of their election. Likewise, as believers, uh, we can choose in disobedience to not fulfill the purposes of our election. And that's a very sad choice when we go down that road. Um, notice also the very strong uh, continual corporate language here in Colossians 3, um, referring to one another. Again, it's just a confirmation that the context is clearly the church, the body of Christ, and not simply on an individual uh, individual basis. So th there's a lot more that we could say there, but again, for time's sake, we're going to, to move ahead now to uh, 1 Thessalonians. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 1 through 7, there's a couple of things to notice here, but I'm going to read this passage. Uh, Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy to the church of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. 
Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you in our prayers, remembering without ceasing your work of faith, your labor of love, and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of our God and Father, knowing, beloved brethren, your election by God. For our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and in much assurance, as you know what kind of men we were among you for your sake. And you became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Spirit, so that you became examples to all in Macedonia and Achaia who believe. Sorry, is my sound coming through okay? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, it's, it's coming through. There was just a brief period there, Peter, where there was a little bit of an echo, but uh, otherwise everything's fine. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you. Yes. Just a few things to, to note here. Um, again, it's not referring to individuals, but it's referring to the church. Again, see that he addresses the church of the Thessalonians in God. We, thank, we give thanks to God always for you all. And there's this continual language. He's addressing a group of people, not individuals. The other thing that we see clearly is that Paul is expressing confidence that they were chosen for a great purpose. And he cites the evidence of their faithful service and their testimony. Um, your work of faith, your labor of love, your patience of hope. As a result of the evidences that he sees, he is confident that they are elect of God. And he then goes on to state that they are fulfilling the purposes of that election. In chapter one, he says that the word of God has sounded out from them into the whole region so that all know clearly uh, the, the testimony of the gospel and that they have turned from idols to serve the living God. So I think, you know, when you, when you look at this passage again, it's telling us that, that they were fulfilling the purposes of God in election. Um, Paul is not saying, I know that you are chosen for salvation because of what I see in you. But rather he's saying, when I see how receptive you are to the word of God and your eager response to follow the Lord, to be teachable, uh, you, your immense joy, even under persecution, uh, the powerful testimony that you have across the whole region. I know that God has chosen you for a great purpose and I already see him fulfilling his plans through you. And I think that's a, that's a tremendous commendation that Paul is giving to them. I think, you know, a good cross reference here would, might be second Peter chapter one and verse 10. As in second Peter one, verse 10, he speaks of co uh, confirming, your call and election, making sure of your call and election. He says, for if you do these things, you will never stumble. And we can certainly see the Thessalonian church uh, was confirming their calling and election, confirming uh, what God had called them to and chosen them for and fulfilling that purpose. Again, a lot more that could be said, but we're going to move ahead for time's sake to Titus chapter one, uh, the first three verses in Titus 1, Paul, a bondservant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect and the acknowledgement of the truth which accords with godliness, in the hope of eternal life, which God, who cannot lie, promised before time began, but has in due time manifested his word through preaching, which was committed to me according to the commandment of God, our Savior. The letters written addressed to Titus, but he obviously intended for it to be read publicly to the churches on the island of Crete. So he begins with a general introduction. So again, there's some things to note as we look at this little passage. Uh, the word uh, eklekton that is used here, again, is plural. He's not addressing title as, Titus as an individually elect unto salvation person but he is talking to the group of believers as being elect. Um, I think the second thing to notice is this little phrase, um, according to the faith of God's elect, 
which might better be translated for the sake of God's elect. Um, there's a direct connection between the phrases, uh, the, the sake of God's elect and the acknowledgement of the truth. So the faith of God's elect and the acknowledgement of truth. The elect are those who have faith, they have believed and they have acknowledged the truth. Again, speaks of decisions, choices that, that have been made. This is not a passive thing. It's not something that was done to them or applied to them, uh, but rather this speaks of an act of choice on, on their behalf. Um, they have chosen to follow the truth. The word acknowledge there is a very strong word. Um, it's actually in an intensive form. So it's not just that they acknowledge some facts, but rather uh, there was a, an, an active choice to participate in the truth, uh, to acquire the knowledge of the truth and to become obedient to the truth. So that acknowledging the truth again is not passive, but it's very, very active. And so Paul sees himself as an apostle for the sake of these people who have believed. Uh, these people who make up the church and through whom God has a specific purpose to be worked out. So I'm just going to go back there for uh, one second. Um, in Ephesians chapter 4, we read there that the Lord Jesus, as the risen head of the church, gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. And so Paul, being one of those apostles that the risen Lord has given as a gift, as a benefit to the church, his goal is to edify the saints so that they would grow spiritually, so that they would mature. And he expresses that thought in Colossians 1, 28, 29, it says, him, that's Christ, we preach, warning every man, teaching every man in all wisdom, that we may present every man perfect or mature in Christ. To this end, I labor, striving according to his working, which works in me mightily. So it's for the sake of the elect of God that Paul is ministering, that he is striving. And uh, I think that's very clear, and there's lots of cross-references. So in effect... Titus 1 teaches that Paul is an apostle for the sake of these believers and their personal appropriation of the truth and their living out of the reality of that truth in maturity and, of course, in holiness as well. So again, moving along to 1 Peter chapter 1, I think this is a very important uh, section here. So I want to just spend a little bit of time on it. The, it's a verse which has created a lot of confusion and, and I think caused a lot of debate and hopefully we can clarify a little bit here. Um, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ to the pilgrims of the dispersion, and he mentions five areas, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father in sanctification of the Spirit for obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, grace to you and truth be multiplied. Um, the little word foreknowledge has caused a lot of, of debate, and we won't go into all of that tonight. Again, I hope to clarify that in a, in a couple of weeks. But basically, we have two major schools of thought on the word foreknowledge here. And the Arminian school looks at this and, and, and reads this where it says, elect according to the foreknowledge of God. And so they say, God chose for salvation those individuals that he foresaw would choose to believe in Christ as Savior. So their election is conditional. It is conditioned on their foreseen faith. So that is the classic Arminian position. Still individual election unto salvation, but it's based on their foreseen faith. Calvinism teaches that God chose some individuals according to the foreknowledge of God, but in their view, foreknowledge equals foreordination or being predetermined in eternity. In other words, their election was entirely without any conditions, was unconditional, didn't depend on them, but God in eternity past simply picked certain individuals 
to, to be in Christ, to come to Christ, to, to be saved. And they would claim that Christ only died for that limited group of people elect unto salvation. And so that's kind of where a lot of the debate has swirled in, in that verse. But um, I want to present to you an alternative view <laughs> and, and one that for me was a very liberating view. And, uh, and, and it comes directly from the text. So a couple of po some points. Firstly, the word elect is in the plural there. Elect according to foreknowledge of God is not saying you individually are elect, but as a group of believers, you, you are elect. So it's plural. But when we look at the construction of the sentence in the Greek, and, and I don't claim to be, you know, the be all and end all of being a Greek scholar. I also access materials and, and reference work and, and discuss this with various people. But from everything that I can put together, it seems clear that in the Greek sentence, the word elect is associated with and modifies the word pilgrims. But the word elect has no connection in the sentence with foreknowledge. So in our English translations, it says elect according to the foreknowledge of God. And that causes a confusion because it ought not to be translated in that way. The word elect is connected with pilgrims, not foreknowledge. What is foreknowledge connected with it? The word foreknowledge in the sentence is associated with the word dispersion, the word dispersion. So if we can put it in the way that the Greek puts it, it says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the elect pilgrims of the dispersion, which is according to the foreknowledge of God. So that clarifies it. That changes the whole flavor of the sentence. They are elect pilgrims. They have been persecuted and so dispersed. That dispersion, that persecution that they're facing is according to the foreknowledge of God. It's not election that's according to the foreknowledge of God in this verse. It's the dispersion which is according to the foreknowledge of God. And I think once we, we, we frame the discussion in that way, uh, it's very, very helpful indeed. So I think um, when you look at the, the reread the sentence, reread the, the, the context of what Peter is talking about, the whole of First Peter, he is ministering to these believers who have gone through terrible trials, still going through persecutions and trials, and he writes to comfort them. And what better way to comfort them than from the beginning of his epistle to reassure them what, it, what you're going through has not taken God by surprise. This is, this is part of his foreknowledge. And, and he is with you in it. And this is not an unusual thing. However, realize that God has chosen you for a purpose and a privilege to suffer this persecution. I think when we hear those words, that sounds very foreign to us. It's, well, I don't want to be chosen for persecution and for suffering. That sounds awful. Uh, but, but as you follow through the context of 1 Peter, that's exactly what he's saying. And in fact, that is a theme of all of the New Testament as well. They were chosen to undergo tremendous loss for the sake of the gospel. They were chosen to go through a fiery trial for the sake and the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, suffering for Christ is a privilege, and the New Testament teaches us that. Matthew 5, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, because theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when men shall revile you and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my, my name's sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness. In Acts 5 and 41, the disciples departed from the presence of the council after they had been uh, warned, they were beaten, they, they were treated very badly, but they rejoiced that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. Wow, that's, that's incredible, that's amazing. Philippians 1.29, for you it has been granted on behalf of Christ, not only to believe, to follow him, to, to know him, to rejoice in him, but to suffer for his sake. 
Wow. And I think that's just, that's, that's so significant for us there. So Peter is writing to, to comfort and strengthen these dispersed believers, assuring them that this trial is within the plan and purpose of God. It's within the knowledge of God. Uh, you're suffering, but the Lord is in it and he is with you through it. And later in the same epistle, Peter explains uh, in chapter 4 and verse 12, it's by no means unusual for the followers of Christ. Here, just a few verses on in 1 Peter chapter 1, he speaks of them being purified as gold, which is refined by fire. God has a great purpose. He's chosen you for the purpose uh, to, to go through this. And all things work together for good to them that love God and are called according to his purpose. And what is that purpose that the Lord would achieve in believers through suffering? It's sanctification, isn't it? It's holiness. It's purifying us. It's making us let go of the world, of worldly things, of sin, of fleshliness. Uh, it's, it's making us focus on the Lord, to see him more clearly, to appreciate him, to, to understand we, we are members of the body of Christ. We're citizens of heaven. We, we have every blessing in the heavenlies in Christ Jesus. We have an eternal inheritance in him. And so, so much there that is so beautiful. But sometimes we don't see it and we don't appreciate it unless we go through hardships. And in you know, verses one through, f through uh, three through five in chapter one of First Peter, he guarantees that their inheritance in glory is preserved for them and they are preserved. So take courage, take courage. There's a great purpose in them. Well, th there's more reasons for their election. Uh, that was the, the first one is that they're chosen uh, for the suffering and for purification. But connected to that, he, he lists these two. He says, for obedience to Christ Jesus and for the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus. And again, this is uh, in this idea of, of purifying, of, of sanctifying, of maturing in holiness. First uh, Thessalonians 4.3 says, this is the will of God, your sanctification. Uh, we saw in Ephesians 1, we're chosen in him and we should be holy and without blame. In Colossians 3.12, the elect are holy and beloved. So I think, again, this is, this is crucial. A quick clarification here. Um, Peter's use of the word sprinkling here, uh, there's no definite article. So it's actually not for the sprinkling, but actually for a sprinkling of the blood. Uh, if it had the definite article in the Greek, it would more be relating to salvation. But a sprinkling is, is more in the sense of ongoing cleansing. Um, of learning how to walk in, in holiness and chosen for obedience to, to Christ. Again, choice. Uh, just because people are elect doesn't mean the purposes of those elections, election follows automatically. We have to choose obedience. We have to choose uh, to walk in holiness. And reading through the New Testament, that's very, very clear and very, very obvious. Uh, but of course, a challenge, a disobedient believer walking in darkness is a, is a contradiction. Um, God's plan, pattern and purpose for believers individually, for believers as members of the church, uh, God's plan and pattern for us corporately as believers. We are chosen to be holy. We are his own special people that we may proclaim the praises of him who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. So there's a lot here. Um, very quickly in, in closing, in 1 Peter 2, verses 4 through 9, lovely passage of scripture. I don't have time to read it tonight, but we read, coming to him as a living stone, rejected indeed by men, but chosen, chosen by God and precious, obviously referring to, to the Lord Jesus here himself. Uh, he is preeminently the chosen one. Um, and as the chosen elect one of God, all who come to him in faith, all who are the faithful in Christ Jesus, all who are the saints, joined to him uh, are in inheritors of all that he has accomplished. He is chosen and beloved, and all who are in Christ are chosen and, and beloved also. The world despises and rejects him, but the Father loves him, and to the Father he is precious. And what an amazing thing, we are accepted in him in the beloved one. In 1 Peter 2 and verse 9, uh, the, we read, 
of now the church, which is beloved and elect in Christ. Uh, you, are his, you are a chosen generation, royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people. Right? Notice all the collective nouns there, the corporate language, the, the group language, right? generation, priesthood, nation, people. Again, okay, not speaking of individual election here. Uh, a couple of points to note in passing. Um, these believers have been persecuted. They've been scattered through a number of different areas, but chosen for a grand purpose to proclaim or, or to make widely known uh, the, the, the Lord's praises, even through their suffering, to proclaim his praises. Right? And so the more they were persecuted, the more that they were spread, the more they carried the message of the gospel with them wherever they went. Ephesians 1, 6 says, the church is to the praise of the glory of his grace by which he made us accepted in the beloved one. Um, they were a royal priesthood and a holy nation. They bore a testimony to the world uh, and they represented God to the world and they prayed on behalf of, of the world. Um, and we've, as we've discovered repeatedly, the word election never means that God has chosen some individual to the exclusion of all others. But even where he chooses people for a purpose, that purpose usually involves uh, telling others about him that they may come to also taste and see that the Lord is good. Uh, interesting, these believers are not just chosen, but they're a chosen generation. And the word generation in the Greek is genos. It doesn't mean an age, a period of time, but rather a generation in the sense of offspring, family, kin, lineage, or stock. Um, Abraham was God's chosen in the Old Testament. All of his physical seed are chosen in Abraham. Uh, likewise, Christ is the beloved. Uh, Christ is, is the, the chosen of God and all who are in him, who enter him through spiritual rebirth, are his chosen generation, his offspring. Abraham's family come into it by natural birth. Christ's family come into it by spiritual birth. So there's a lot here uh, that we looked at very, very quickly in terms of, of the church. The church is elect in Christ. Purpose, holy, and, and, and blameless before him in love. Christ is loved in him. We are loved. Christ is accepted. My beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. In Christ we are accepted as well. The church, marvelous mystery, hidden in the Old Testament times, now revealed. And uh, the purpose of that is the manifold wisdom of God. Um, Thessalonians and Colossians reveal that the elect have a responsibility to choose to fulfill the purposes of their election. And Peter shows us that the elect are to bear a testimony, uh, that they have a responsibility in terms of declaring the praises of the Lord and giving evidence of the reality of being brought out of darkness into God's marvelous light. So very quick movement through that, uh, through that section. Uh, I hope that there's a little bit of clarity to it and that it's been uh, a bit of a, a blessing. And uh, there are some more details in the book if you want to uh, read up a bit further details that I've skipped over here. Thank you again for the privileged opportunity to be with you. And I look forward to these next uh, three weeks with you as well, Lord willing. So God bless.